All right. Hello, people. Welcome, everybody, and happy to have all of you in another episode of the AppSec Engineer podcast. And I am really, really excited about today's guest. It's someone that we've been kind of wanting to talk to for a really, really long point in time. He's someone who's multifaceted. We're going to see a lot of what he can do, apart from what we're going to discuss today from an application security perspective. Uh, he's someone who's got almost like a veteran in terms of uh, application security and information security. He's led the Aetna's security uh, team for over a decade, and now he's the acting CISO of an amazing company up in Bay Area called Bluescape, uh, who I really love and, and I really like the way that they work. So he works up there uh, as of now. And welcome everybody to today's podcast. And we have Mark Willis from Bluescape. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good, doing fine. Hi, Rahul. Good to see you. I know. And one of the things that you're going to have a lot of podcast hosts say is how long they've been waiting to have Mark on their podcast because Mark has been yeah. busy over the last year um, setting up things for Bluescape and doing some wonderful things. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but then um, he finally has the time to come on and uh, come on to these podcasts. So thank you for joining us, Mark. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it's been... Uh... A journey. It's been a heck of a journey uh, with, with, with Bluescape over the last 14, 15 months. So yeah. um, I know we had talked early on uh, about you know, a while back for doing a podcast. I said, just give me some time. I want to get a year under my belt. I just don't want to... Um, there, there's there's people in this business, let's be honest. There are some people in this business that are... It's all about them, and they're really out for self-promotion. And that's the last thing that I want to be doing. I, don't, I, I didn't want to be seen as oh, Mark trying to go out and, uh, you know, um, you know, promote himself. I wanted to show that we, um, that we can go, that someone can go from, um, a company, the size of CVS Aetna and make that transition and go to a small Silicon Valley startup as a CISO and make that transition and not only make the transition, but be successful and, and help the company, uh, move along into the, the next level of, of where we're at. So, I wanted to get all of that in place and have a good story to tell when the time came for us to actually have the podcast. Wonderful. I think that makes a lot of sense. And for all of viewers who are essentially wondering about what this cool thing behind Mark is from where he's speaking, I think that's what Mark likes to call the 1767 man loft. Isn't that right, Mark? Yes. So if you can kind of see here, like the, the beams. Yeah. Um, so I live in Maine and my house was built in 1820. And then this is what they call the L that is on the side. It, this was brought up from Massachusetts. It's from 1767. I found the date, but it was all open. The the beams, when they come together at the top, right, there's a wooden peg that goes in there. And over time, it is kind of knotted. It's twisted. So you really can't, um, you could never, you could never take those apart. You would need a chainsaw to cut it, to get, to get them apart. If you have to lift the whole thing off the ground to move it, what have you. So, um, I floored it off, put the ceiling in and everything. And now it's turned into my, you know, my studio, uh, which is really cool because it's quiet. And, uh, my wife and my daughter are back in the house and the other side, they can't hear me. I can't hear them. So it makes, it makes it really easy for a podcast where I know some people who are struggling with COVID-19 and working from home don't necessarily have a setup, right? They were working. This is something that really, ever, you know, everybody's dealing with some way, either you're dealing with it directly in your home or you're de dealing with people, coworkers who are trying to, trying to find a, a safe place to, you know, get someplace quiet where they can uh, hold a call. Um, not everybody's got a setup where they can work from home. A lot of people were in the office just moving right along and doing their thing. And then with COVID, hey, now I got to work from home. Um, I may or may not really have the setup that I, would like and so people have had to kind of adjust and work around that um but with this setup here i'm lucky enough to be able to uh yeah. have this but that one goes back to the the point of your earlier when you said about working from etna uh, from for you know working at etna for 10 years um you know i've been working from home for a long time so i'm living proof that you can do it you know that i'd like to be an advocate for those who have kind of been on the fence you know hey, can i really work from home and be productive i i the, the answer is obviously yes and um, you know, for doing it for a decade. Um, if I can do it, anybody can do it, right? It's just a matter. Of, I know people like to go in the office and see each other and hang out and socialize. And that's really important too. But until that 
comes back, if it really does come back again, um, we're kind of stuck doing this. So make the most of it and build out your man, build out your your man or, or woman loft, whoever you may be. Uh, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I know, and I, I, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot more about working from home and COVID and what that means for application security, especially. But but I want to start off with something that I read very interesting, and I think this was in your RSA talk as as a as I think part of your bio in your RSA talk that says it was a it was a train journey in 1988 from from Germany that you took that kind of really uh, uh, instilled your 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 interest in security to kind of take off the security journey. I just found that very interesting, yeah. Mark. Yeah, so, I mean, back in, well, you're going way back. I mean, that's, that 1980, I was 19 years old and I was backpacking through Europe and I decided to, um, you know, I, I was in Copenhagen, Denmark and I had a Eurail pass. I was just kind of cruising around and, um, I saw up on the, you know, the train station, you know, all the different cities yeah. come up in the times back then. And so I saw Berlin and I said, Hey, I, I really want to go check out Berlin. So I walked up to the, um, to the, to the, to the, to the cashier and I talked to him for a second. He said, well, you can get there, but you got to pay for it. It's not on your, your rail pass. And you have to, it's interesting. You're, you're going to have to take a, an East German ferry boat uh, from Denmark to Wismar and then get on an East German train and then travel through the night and then come into East Berlin and then you'll cross over into West Berlin. And I'm like, okay, sure. You know, so I'm 19 years old and uh, thought that was pretty cool. You know, something, you know, let's, let's check this out. So we get on the East German ferry boat, right? And it's all, it looks like something from the 1960s. It's all gray and really nondescript. I'm like, mm. This is kind of you know very blase, very bland. I'm like, mm. and then we get on the train, right? And I you just I sat down where I wanted to, and I was in a car. I remember I was in a compartment with a French guy and two girls from Denmark, I think. And they were like, you know, there were like five of us who were not we were not Germans, you know, we're not East German, or you know. And so the East German uh, you know officer came in and opened the door and and uh, asked for our passports, and he got to me last. And he saw that I was an American and he looks at me, he looks at it and he, and he says, you come here, you know, come and see here. And so, as so I had to grab my backpack and he basically walked me down the hallway to another compartment and opened the door. And, and as we're walking down the, the compartment, he's tapping, he's just kind of tapping his gun on his side. I'm like, really? Uh, you know, I'm like, really? You know? And so I'm, I, this is, you know, again, 19 years old, taking all this in and, uh, so I, I ended up in a compartment with a, with a very old lady and, and her granddaughters from Hungary. And uh, I, I pulled out the map of Europe and they pointed to Hungary from where they were from. And so things were starting to get real when we got into East Berlin and you were going through the different stops. And the very last stop, it must have been like the big train station there. Um, that's where mo that's where um, if you were from the east and, and that was it, um, you had to get off the train. And the, the guards brought in the dogs. It was just like the movies. They had the Uzis and the dogs, and they went through compartment by compartment. But but when we got there, the, it was like the, the grandmother and the, and the daughters, they knew the drill. They stood up. They had their bags. They were almost like standing at attention with their bags. And when the guy came in, they off they went. And I remember her looking at me and giving me this look like, you get to keep going, but I've got to get off the train. And... Um, going over to, to, uh, West Berlin, um, you know, over there for a few days. Um, I, I noticed that at, 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 that, that wasn't checkpoint Charlie it was a different checkpoint, but the army, um, guys, the, the soldiers there, uh, they were pulling guard and I could see that, that, that it was stressful, right. It was, but it was, it, it was intense. And, um, you know, that got me thinking about, um, you know, I went to East Berlin for one day. We went, we went over there and came back and, um, you know, we got back across the back across into by midnight. If you didn't get back by midnight, then you had to pay like a hundred dollars. They would hold you there. But the whole experience really uh, made me start to think about getting into uh, or the, thinking more about maybe I should join the army someday, or maybe I should, you know, that the security was was important. And 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 uh, this is this is no joke, right? The, no, this is this is this is serious stuff that I'm I'm playing around as a kid. You know, a young man, but the the reality was setting in, and this is some serious stuff going on in the world. So that kind of resonated there. And then when I went into the army in '93, 
I went into counterintelligence. So I, that kind of fed into that line. When I went to the Army and wanted to join, um, I tried to figure out what area I wanted to go into. And uh, when I found out they, the counterintelligence area, I was like, well, that, that's, that's really cool. I want to do that. Um, so that got me into that. And uh, then the rest was just, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it if you want. But, I mean, that, that's kind of how I got yeah. into it. And, yeah. uh, and it's, it's very, just, very, just very different path, right? Yeah, and it's just interesting that how something like that could kind of really seed uh, a thought that kind of just has almost like a resonating effect from from army, and then you kind of, I think, I think from a brief point you worked with Sterling, um, mm-hmm. and 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 you did, and eventually, as luck might have it, you came back into Aetna from a security perspective, um, yeah, as well. Yeah. Uh, so. So in the army, um, when I was over in Germany, went to Bosnia a couple of times, but also got into programming a lot more, got back into it um, and um, uh, got my master's degree in information systems management and got a job when I got out working for Sterling Software as a software engineer for US Army INSCOM because I had the security clearance. And so they needed people on a project to do some stuff. Um, and uh over time, I mean, uh, Northrop Grumman bought out um, you know, where there was Sterling and then Computer Associates and then Northrop Grumman came in. But I ended up being the uh, the IT liaison between U.S. Army INSCOM and NSA, uh, that the, the personnel divisions. I was going back and forth a lot between uh, those two organizations. And uh, you think it's hard enough just trying to keep the Army data straight, but try, try sitting down with the Navy and the Air Force and all the different services, try to figure it out. Yeah, you, you can't even agree. I mean, we sat there for, you know, four hours, five hours one day, just trying to figure out, you know, to agree on one little piece of data. Um, I mean, and that's probably fast, right? That's probably fast in the, in the scheme of how things work. Um, but then, uh, you know, uh, you know, coming out of the, uh, the army, um, you know, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, working, you know, given with, with storing software um, and, and the whole group. And then I got into uh, ethical hacking. Uh, I have a buddy who's uh, from the army and had his own company and had me moonlighting doing that as well. Oh. Found out that that, you know, being a developer and having that mindset really allows you to, you know, when you start to look at the code or that, you know, and uh, even, even just the HTML, how they're doing things, you could just see whether these guys knew what they were doing or not. Um, and uh, we were just, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. You were finding all kinds of vulnerabilities out there. This is back in, you know, 2000 and, you know, 2007, right. 2008. And uh, it was just a free for all. And um, and then when Aetna came along in, in 2009, I, I came on and um, joined their team and we helped build that out over time. Um, you know, uh, we uh, we really, you know, global security ultimately became like over 200 people there with all different families. But by, by being involved in a big organization like that, you got to be involved in all kinds of things like incident response and, uh, you know, all types of other uh, initiatives uh, b- beyond software security, and uh, that really helped feed into the whole, you know, uh, picture when Bluescape came along. Um, that I was able to walk into that and um, you know hit the ground running in a lot of areas. So one of the I'm I'm really going to get to the whole elephant in the room for me in terms of the biggest question that I wanted to kind of ask you when I knew we were going to talk is many times, Mark, I have personally spoken to people who've kind of moved from a startup um, scene from an up against security prof- uh, perspective and then they've moved to the enterprise standpoint and they yeah. often they often talk about what's called the cultural issue of of kind of implementing application security in scale or or, or not even in scale just the fundamentals of implementing appsec um, uh, principles Mm-hmm. Now, you've been somebody who's kind of come from Aetna uh, to an organization that's probably less than half the size of Aetna, if, I, if I'm right. Yeah. Um, so presumably, someone from the outside like me would think that should be easy. However, I'm sure there's a part of me that says, wait a minute, that's not true. I mean, if there's something that's going to be so dynamically different between two worlds, and I'd like to call it uh, really the difference between the East and the West coast of the US, right? On, on you have the East Coast, which has the large enterprises, which yeah. is like the eight news of the world. And then you have the, the typical value-based companies like Bluescape, very different kinds of working scenarios, very different in terms of their objectives, in terms of how mm-hmm. they want to achieve what they want to achieve. So 
I really want to understand from you in terms of what do you see as the striking contrast between moving from Aetna to Bluescape? What, what are the things that, that, that really worked for you because of Aetna? And what are the things that were new for you in terms of working for Bluescape? What, 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 what was really the difference in terms of the two worlds? Um, I would say, you know, if, if you, can, you can bridge the gap between the two if you are someone who's willing to roll up their sleeves, get your hands dirty and, and get in there and, and do the work. Um, and don't expect someone to do the work that you're not willing to do yourself, right? If you, if you the more technical you are, um, the more you can prove that you can you can hang uh, with the more technical folks. Uh, it's going to be easier to 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 do that. Um, if you're if you're um, you know a, a leader who's got a good um, a strategic vision, that's great, and you want to have that. But if you don't have the the the, the background, the technical background, it's going to be a little rough. I mean, to build in. Um, um, assurances from the team. Um, in both cases, I've been able to roll up my sleeves in both cases and, and and do what's necessary. You do what you have to do to accomplish the mission, to accomplish the job. But, you know, the mission of a large company, a Fortune, you know, 50 company is, is perhaps, you know, different than, um, you know, a, a small startup. In the end, the commonality is you both want to be secure. You want to be as secure as you possibly can. And what that means uh, for an organization, um, a huge organization, it might take two or 300 people to do that uh, from, from a huge attack surface, right? A smaller company like Bluescape might have a totally different attack surface. And you need to understand that attack surface in both cases to be able to protect it. And so I would say, um, you know, it, for example, software security at when I was at Aetna, we had a you know very large team. Perhaps it was known as the number one software security program in the world. And that wasn't me saying that. That was our leadership going around saying that, which it tended to put a target on our back in some cases, right? It was not always, um, you know, uh, something that you wanted people to talk about all the time. But it's but we were really good. Um, so bringing that to Bluescape from AppSec is I don't have a huge team. I don't have a huge team. Mark has to roll up his sleeves and do some things himself, um, but which is fine. I, I don't mind doing that. I don't mind putting it in the time to do that. Um, and uh, but, you, but what you do have is you have a lot of really super smart people who are willing to put in the hours themselves when the time is available. And they have a lot of really great skills that you can leverage what I call organic talent. You know, they may not be security professionals, but they care about security and they may not be, you know, up on all the different and latest attacks, but they learn very quickly. Everybody learns very quickly what, what's going on. And when you sit down and talk about a certain vulnerability, you can get right to the point. Um, and the cool thing about uh, the, the Bluescape um, environment is that you don't have like layers and layers and layers of uh, large company bureaucracy. You can you can ping somebody on Slack. You can pull a, pull together a meeting ASAP if you have to to get something done. You can get things done very quickly. Uh, if they need to be done quickly, you don't have to go through a whole committee to do that. Um, you know, now we do have our open source committee, for example, where we review open source. We do our, our application security uh, monthly groups that we do have those things. Those more traditional, solid, um, you know, um, more, more corporate type things. Um, but it's uh, it, there. There definitely is a cultural difference between the two, and as long as you understand the culture that you're working in, right? If you want to, then you, you should be okay. If you, if, if, but if somebody comes from a, an East coast, uh, culture where you're used to pointing fingers and saying, you go here, you do that, you do that, right. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm more aloof or a, a, above all that. Right. Um, you're going to have a hard time probably at, at a place like Bluescape. Um, you, that's just not going to work. I mean, in some cases you can provide the big picture, which I do, but um, that, that's just in for people's awareness. But when it comes to um, getting things done, you're in the Jira tickets, you're in Confluence, you're dealing with um, you know, vendors, you're, you're doing the questionnaires, you're meeting with, with different people on the other side of, you're meeting directly with people doing all kinds of things, engineers, architects, um, reviewing diagrams, reviewing um, different initiatives. Uh, those are things that you're just dealing with all the time that is cool from a, a, a Bluescape perspective because at, at a larger company on the East Coast, right, like Aetna, um, you're you're more, um, you know, 
pigeonholed into your specific direction, your, your division. You may touch on other things, but you're not going to have a, a day-to-day, full, comprehensive, uh, hands-on uh, across different areas. There's just too many people. That's just too big. And so, it, like, again, if you have that cultural understanding, I think you'll, you should be okay. But, you know, going into it, don't, don't go from a, a startup to an East Coast huge, you know, Fortune 50 company and expect to be involved in everything like you were in, in the startup. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. And one of the things that I've personally heard you say in other interviews and, and, and in our interactions as well is one of your key objectives in Bluescape is for you to kind of get almost the same level of security as what you would have in a fortune 50, but do that in 25 cents to a dollar. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it, that's, that's really your, your key area now. And now that's interesting that you mentioned that because when you talk about doing that, as much as you can't throw people at the problem, like what you would do in a larger organization where you would have 200, 300 people reporting into you and yeah. you could kind of have that. And you, and here's like you rightly said, you really have to roll up your sleeves and do that. But what it really boils down to still having is a very, very core and a talented team, which I know um, uh, Bluescape and you have been kind of building over the last couple of yeah. months as well. Now, the interesting question that I have for you, Mark, is one of the things that I've seen, and this is probably something that touches upon with HR slash the recruitment drive as well, is when you look up AppSec uh, resumes, or when you kind of look up job descriptions for application security, yeah talent, you would more often than not see almost like an Avenger level of description of skills that they would need. Oh, I need an application security engineer who's able to do threat modeling, who's able to also remediate code, who's also able to look at automation, who's also able to understand compliance because they need because the company is PCI or HIPAA certified, yeah. and they also need to be able to submit vendor assessment. So, so, so for a company like Bluescape or any other company where you can't really have multiple people do various things. At the same time, you need AppSec engineers to be multifaceted. Um, mm-hmm. Where does a CISO kind of draw the line in terms of in terms of saying these are the critical skills that I need in one person, and here's where I'd kind of move on to another person. So yeah. because because this is a very very uh, common thing that I see in a lot of job descriptions in the Bay Area these days. Yeah, I mean, you know, everybody's looking for the perfect candidate, right? You got to have all this, right, Superman stuff. I'm um, not going to find it, right? I mean, there's always, I, I walk into saying that no one's going to know all that. If that person has all those skills, they're probably hired somewhere else, right? They're, why are they, why are they available, right? So, um, what I, what I'm looking for and for, you know, I've mentioned before on a call, um, just recently, another podcast is that I'm looking for people who that are that are hungry, that are that that aren't know it alls, or think they know it all, because we none of us do, and we're all in this together to try to sort this stuff out. Um, but as somebody who's willing to rope their sleeves, bring in technical skills, bring in the requisite, um, you know, requisite uh, skills to to do this. Um, I uh, I'm looking for someone who's got a who I I, I said before when I interview them I know it when I see it I know it when I see it um, but what I will ask them is um, you know you say you've uh, done this and that you know explain to me how you did this or that right um, I want to know are they are they full of it you know are they pulling my leg or are they really someone who actually did something. So I think it's the Elon Musk approach where he will do the same thing where he'll say, oh, cool. Uh, you, you know, you said you led such and such project or built such and such application. Explain to me that process of how you went through it. What did you actually do? Right. And if you can do that, right, if you, you'll figure out whether they were just like on the team, right, they were just kind of hanging out and doing a few things, taking direction, or were they really the ones that did it? Um, you know, and that either, either way, it's cool. It just, you just want to make sure that, that you're getting the kind of person who, um, has done something, has built something and is willing to go into new situations, maybe not knowing everything, but they sorted it out. They figured it out. 
a lot of programming, as you know, is not just being able to code in such and such language. It's being able to experiment and go back and forth and trial and error and trial and error and try this and that and not give up and not give up and, and say, oh, I can't figure this out. You find a way to figure things out. I want to find the person that has been able to figure things out and apply those skills to uh, our, our Bluescape environment. I, I, I've just I've hired one person recently and uh, he's a young guy and he's uh, he's got the right stuff that we like and um, it's been working out great. Uh, someone who can work with the architects, the engineers, ops, and then working for me. Um, and uh, so kind of like a Swiss army knife, but not a, but not a, you know, a Batman or Superman Swiss army knife. Someday this person will be, will have that list. Right. And that's, yeah. and that's another thing, Rahul, is that in this business, right. I mean, we want to help people who come in and we want to get them up to speed on a lot of things and they're going to let them grow let them expand and build that resume out. Not that we want to lose them, but it's their career, right? I mean, and that they need to be able to have to show that they've done things. And hopefully, uh, you know, we treat them well enough and pay them well enough and do all the things to keep them around so they don't leave. But you, you don't want to stifle people in this business. And I've seen that too. I've seen people just try to take good people and put them into certain areas and say, you know what? I don't want them getting too good. I, I, I don't want to lose so-and-so, right? You know, so that's just not the way to do it. You want to build up and, and build uh, talent and let people grow and, and do great things together. You know, I think um, one of the most controversial statements that I have, I think, more often said in some of the speeches and the talks that I've done is for long, um, security professionals have gone and spoken to developers saying, hey, you need to understand security. You need to understand security coding principles. You need to understand how to write secure code. You need to understand how to remediate secure code. And I often say it's about time that we kind of track back that statement and say, yes, security uh, uh, developers need to understand security, but it's about time that security folks started to understand code, mm -hmm. yeah, right? Absolutely. Because everybody is everybody's talking about automation. It's the whole DevSecOps model or security mm -hmm. as a code model. But to me, when you talk about co, when you talk about automation, I think that pretty much boils down to a fundamental granular building block that's code and code times N is automation, if, yeah. if you were to argue that way. So as a CISO, especially, we're still talking about an age in which you're kind of talking about for every 100 developers, you have 10 DevOps, and for every 10 DevOps, you have one AppSec engineer. You're still talking about that ratio. Yeah. In, and, and still, everybody's kind of, hunting for that one good AppSec engineer. Now, with these constraints in perspective, um, I want to kind of pick your brains about what, how, how important do you think is for CISOs to be particular that AppSec engineers understand code? I think the CISO, I, I think you start with the CISO themselves. The, the CISO is just, <laughs> right? We got CISOs running around out there that, that some do and some don't, right? But You've got some CISOs out there that 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 might say that they're experts in AppSec, but they've never written a line of code, and they couldn't tell if you put code around. They couldn't. If, they could. They can't tell the difference between C plus plus and and Python, right? They 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 wouldn't know how to, how to run a code review. Which okay, and some people might say, oh yeah, CISO shouldn't do that. But um, if if someone's going to be going out there from a software security perspective and hiring people for AppSec. Right. And they have their opinions about what is right and wrong with with AppSec. Right. But they haven't written a line of code or written a program or have nothing to show from a from a perspective. Then you can kind of wonder, like, OK, where where, where is this coming from? Right. So um, I don't have to worry about that. Um, you know, I, I've written plenty of code and, and, and most recently at Aetna, I wrote uh, you, maybe you could probably find it on that. we I, I wrote a, a tool called APAS. It, it, it basically took it an APK and decompiled it and deobfuscated it and, and basically looked through the code and did did like a it was like a it was like a super grep type thing where it would go through and we would define our own rules and look for for vulnerabilities. So it was something that we used for two reasons that could be used in the CI/CD pipeline pre-build, and then it could also um, be used from an attack perspective, from an ethical hacking 
right? So when it came time for code reviews or for ethical hacking, we, give us your APK, we'll decompile it, we'll take a look and see what you got in there. And uh, it was just another layer of, uh, of defense. Um, when I, I built out the entire mobile applications uh, ethical hacking thing at Aetna, right? There's a lot, of, a lot of code involved in that. So, um, you know, so what I'm looking for an AppSec engineer is someone who's actually, uh, you know, that you don't have to be a super programmer, but you've got to be able to show me the difference between Python and C++ and tell me what are the, you should be able to say, what are the top three vulnerabilities in those types of languages, right? And um, I would say, you know, how many code reviews have you been involved in? Have you, um, have you managed the code review? What is your experience with work sitting down with engineers, right? With developers and explaining to them and performing a code review. Um, there was one time at Aetna, I got called into a, they were having a hard time um, in this situation because they, they, they had somebody talking to the developers and this person was not a not an AppSec person per se, but they were good good people, but they just didn't have the 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 background. So I jumped in there and I was like, oh well, you've got your, you know, your, your issues right here. You're, you know, you're, you're using you know such and such kind of statement. It needs to be a parameterized statement versus a dynamic sequence. So <clears throat> things like that, right? Where you can just identify it, like it right to the point, and say, here's here's the issue, and here's the here's the sink and where it goes in and all that right, with the code review. Um, I think an AppSec uh, professional, again, should have that background. Um, why, why wouldn't you? If you're an AppSec person, why wouldn't you have? Yeah, I think the best way to do it is to start as a developer. Start, you know, make that transition like I did. Start as a developer, get some serious uh, code behind you. I mean, like, you know, projects and stress. You're going to, you know, working late, getting rolling out, you know, builds. Having all that understanding of what the life is like for a developer, so when you go to that developer down the road as this AppSec professional, right, and you're asking them to do something, you've got that empathy that you know how their life is, and that they don't have a lot of time to to sit there and and worry about fixing code. You need to get right to the point. Here are the criticals and the highs that we have to focus on, guys. I, you know, if I see mediums and lows. Right. And a code review, we'll get to that later. You got to go after the critical and highs and you got to be able to figure out which ones are false positives because every tool is going to be throwing false positives at you. That's another great question to ask people in an interview. You know, how do you weed out the false positives from the real yeah. things and to see how they go about that? I'm, I'm interested in how they think. Yeah. What's the process of going through that type of uh, understanding? Right. And again, you can you can figure out from talking to people with those types of questions, how their mind works and their level of experience. I think you used the right word there, Mark. Empathy is is one very, very important thing because when, I, when, when we often talk about security <clears throat> professionals needing to understand code, yes, there's this larger benefit of them being able to practically contribute in terms of alternative remediation strategies or in terms of being able to build up tools themselves uh, and add on to the whole automation bandwagon, but more importantly, at more at, at, at a philosophical level, being able to just talk code and get code gets you really closer to that developer community as well, because you're always going to be looked at as the outsider who's trying to point uh, pick holes into what somebody else has done. But if you really kind of understand what goes on behind mm -hmm. uh, you, I think at, at a very fundamental level, it's really going to help that whole cultural Mm -hmm. um, de silo process that we always talk about, right? You got, you're going to be able to kind of strike up a conversation with the developer, not antagonizing them, and they're going to probably also have that mutual respect and empathy towards towards your role as well. So I think just being yeah. able to understand code has that benefit too. Yeah, and especially if you can come in and um, whether through a vendor or open source, take your pick, whatever works, but able to. Uh, make their lives easier and and provide visibility, right? When when I came into Bluescape, we were I was able to do a few things with the engineers to take about a big flashlight and shine it on some things that we that we needed to fix, and we did. Um, but uh, so in that respect, uh, we hit the ground running in that. And and, and so uh, the engineers have been very very uh, receptive uh, to the idea of uh, us building out a, a world class software security program. And but like I said, it's 25 cents on the dollar. We don't have, you know, um, a huge bank account to, to, to throw at things. So you have to be creative. 
and you have to use open source where you can and you use vendors um, that, that, that can fill those gaps. And so far, so good. Uh, you've it's it's just been over a, over a year for you at at Loosecape, Mark, and mm-hmm. I know that you've been um, part of the reason why you've kind of stayed off podcasts is also because you've been busy and you've been kind of implementing some of these things. Um, so, what has been the past twelve months for you in Loosecape? So, what 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 are things that what are some of the things that has really kept you up and kept kept you busy over the last twelve months? Oh well, I mean, you know, I mean, coming in and just you know walking into a situation where there there was no CISO, there was I'm the first one there, so coming in and understanding the the entire business, right, and and what's going on with the business. You can't be a good CISO if you don't understand the business. Um, no business, no security, right? So you got to have the business uh, and understand, and you got to understand where the what were the top priorities for an organization. One of the top priorities was. We needed to be ISO 27001 certified um, last year. So I hit the ground running with that, right? They needed, they handed that off to me right off the bat, like Mark, take it and run, right? Um, because we were onboarding new clients. Um, and then building out the software security program, um, enterprise wide um, enhancement for email protection, right? The whole, the whole thing about getting, you know, protecting an organization from ransomware, malware, phishing, you know, voice phishing, every, just all of that, um, you know, because everybody's a target. And and then, um, you know, moving into situational awareness, situational intelligence with with, with the Bluescape, the way it works, um, was really getting a lot of attention from the federal side. And then COVID hit. And that changed a lot because while we were used by some you know companies that you would know um in, in expanding uh covid basically launched us into another whole another stratosphere uh, because uh, a lot of people were like wow there's this thing called bluescape out there that can really do what we need to do securely and we can do it all from home or remotely and so our business has just tr- taken off like a rocket and so that has been uh, another aspect of managing uh, expectations of customers in and around that, you know, with, with providing the, the the most up to date uh, information on our security program, and then keeping them informed on on security initiatives that are coming down the road. So all of that is just it's just been been crazy. And then um, you know, new customers, new customers, new customers, um, and the challenges in and around of being you have to be very efficient with your with your <coughs> with your security approach and being able to find the time to fix those vulnerabilities that may pop up that um, that really need to be fixed and un- figure out the ones that can be postponed a little bit longer. I think, I think, ironically, I think Bluescape has been one of the few companies that have seen a tremendous growth yeah. during pro-COVID than ever before, right? I think you guys yeah. have... It's, it, it's, been, it's, it's, been, it's been crazy and it's still it's, going. Yeah, we're, it's still going. You know, we, we're, um, you know, we're, we've almost doubled the amount of people in the company since I joined over a year ago. Wow, that's, that's, that's crazy. Uh, Mark, I wanted to kind of talk to a specific community of security engineers when I asked this question, because it, it, it really kind of, I think I'm asking this question on behalf of that community in terms of with everybody kind of talking about automation, with everybody with this whole DevSecOps movement that's still going, it's been RSA 2015 when, yeah, yeah. when I think Shannon Leeds and the team from Intuit first talked about the whole Sec DevOps model, then it became Sec DevOps yeah. and DevSecOps and rugged DevOps, yeah. and you yeah. could just call it squat for all we care now. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So with this whole thing coming in, one of the questions that keep getting asked is almost like an implicit fear is in terms of saying, how much of a pen tester's role or how much of a security engineer's role is going to change with automation coming in? Um, or the mm-hmm. other way of asking this question is, as a CISO, where would your choice be to have a platform or a product versus where you would still depend on the skills of a highly trained security engineer in AppSec engineering? Yeah. I mean, you want to automate as much as you can, right? And there's other things coming out all the time that may or may not be able to provide visibility, you know, in, as, as far as the CICD, um, the, the process, um, you know, you definitely got to have the SEC in there and then, you know, right. DevSecOps, right? And I, you know, I totally get it. Um, and, you know, it should be, you, know, you, you should, you should be, you should try to automate as much as you can 
but you have to understand that those those tools that automation may or may not provide um, the full picture. Uh, you still need to have your pen testers at, at the end. You still got to have that. You still got to have the the manual that the people who you know. I know it's more expensive at, at, at you know far left of the of the curve, um, but you still need to have that because automation is not going to catch everything. Um, but it will catch uh, um, you know uh, per, you know some. Uh, beforehand. So you want to try to get your, I mean, you're not, you're not doing your due diligence if you're not trying to get as much as you can um, as, as far as, you know, shift left as far as you can. Um, but when you're out, out to the right, I'm sorry, you know, with, with the pen testing, you got to have that as well. You can't just, you know, just automate and push out and say it's good to go. Um, uh, you know, you've got to have some kind of uh, periodic quarterly or, you know, biannual review or internal teams looking at it as well. I wouldn't sacrifice the the pen test, but again, that's only going to give you, you know, a piece too. But right. you're, if you don't do that and something happens, then a lot of questions are going to be asked as to why didn't you, why aren't you guys pen testing your stuff even when it's out there? You know, what, what, what's, what's up with that? Um, if you um, believe that everything can be discovered and, and fixed um, or, or, or they, you know, uh, through automation, um, I'd like to see that. I mean, maybe we'll get there, right? I mean, the, the goal is that we have a big red button, right? Someday, <laughs> you know, my, Mark's dashboard lights up and there's like something blocking a build, right? Something is so bad that we have to block the build, all right? And then someone sits there like Caesar and says, you know, release or, you know, uh, break the build. Um, you know, I, there's, there's, you got to have both. I mean, now that, now that we, we understand that the possibilities are there to to catch a lot of things in the in the pipeline before it goes out. Then why wouldn't you do that? But to rely entirely on that, uh, I mean, I think you got to have both. You got to have a, just like everything the yin and the yang and the balance. You got to have a balance of, of the two, right? I know when you talked about the big red button, I was just reminded of the conversation that I have with my teams when I say, you know what, we're talking about DevSecOps, we're talking about automation, and we need to really tread that line carefully because here's one of the things that marketing and sales teams would probably build castles in the air for CISOs to say, oh, here's the wonderful outcome that comes out of potential automation, but there's more to it than this, that. I mean, the path to go over that is not as smooth as as it seems. So it's easy for you to say that here's a couple of tools that you could stitch up and this would do this for you and then this would do that for you. But then there's just always, there's that whole journey. And I'm sure you've seen that journey in Aetna yeah. from a different lens and now you're kind of seeing that in Bluescape. So I think DevSecOps is more a journey than an outcome by itself. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, you want to you want to get, you know, as much visibility into the, into the build cycle and into the, the pipeline as you can. But you still have to review the findings, right? So, so people still have to look at it and figure out, um, you know, what's real and what's not. Um, the build may go out, but you may have to, you know, follow up and say, "Hey, the build went out." But we've got, you know, a lot of times I think it's better to start off and don't break the build, just let the build go, but but understand what's going on, and then figure out, you know, the, the findings. I'm always skeptical of tools as far as giving 100. <laughs> percent You're, you're going to have your false positives, right? And so, a good AppSec engineer should be able to look at those those findings and weed out the false positives before you sit down with the developers before you bring those things to the engineers right see if you can if you can weed out the garbage right and sit down because if you, if you just sit down with them and say hey here's a bunch of findings and stuff we got to fix this and it turns out that they're false positives then you know they're gonna start tuning you out i've learned that you know uh, over time is that you really want to be able to be very very efficient with your presentation to the developers and say, hey, guys, um, you know, I would even say, hey, man, the tool ran, you know, I got 50 findings and we were we, we, we got down to 10. These 10 are real valid findings. Um, and can you please take a look at this? Let, let's work on this together um, versus just, you know, throwing 50, 50 things over the wall. Um, so you're, you're going to get that with, with automation. But you're in a situation today where there are enough tools out there, enough vendors, enough open source that you, you definitely are, you are not doing your due diligence if you are not uh, trying to automate as much as you can of security into the pipeline. You should be, you should be doing that, but you don't do it at the expense of, uh, well, well we, we, we freed up our pen testing budget. We can go buy something else now, All right? You gotta have, 
Yeah, and, and one of the things that I always say is true automation is not something that replaces a security engineer, but it's something that kind of frees up more space from his or her bandwidth for them mm -hmm. to do something better uh, that only they can do. So it's almost about what can I free up on the plate of my security engineer using automation so they can kind of invest that time better, like you said, either in terms of better testing or in terms of weeding out or positive, or whatever it might be, it's it's it's. Uh, I would look at um, automation to be to have that primary benefit. Yep. Yep. I agree. Um, Mark, I want to talk to you about threat modeling um, as one of the things that a lot of application security teams have talked about. Some have been successful with it, and some not so much. And as someone who's worked, I'm sure, in some form or shape in for threat modeling in Aetna, yep. what do you think are some of the key principles or success factors for AppSec teams to kind of embrace threat model. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 um, it's an interesting concept. A lot of people have heard about it, but they don't really understand what threat modeling really is and what it looks like, right? Show me a threat model. If they see something with a bunch of bo boxes and lines and squares and you know um, this and that, um, okay, okay, so so what? So what? Um, and so. Um, you know, Adam Shostak, the, I call that, the, you know, he's the king of uh, threat modeling, right? He's done a really good job, I think, over the years of kind of um, breaking this down for people. And, uh, you know, it, it comes down to what works for you, for your organization. Um, you know, we use the stride method. Um, and so it's it just depends on, on if you can, you, you know, it, it can be it can be models, it can be uh, textual, um, it can be, and it, it's really something where I, I think one thing about threat modeling Again, this is where you work with the architects and the engineers, and the people who use the product or the, the the whatever it is you do in your organization, whatever it is you sell, whatever your product is, whatever it is that you're making money with, right? Um, talk to the people who have used that product or have worked in that for a long time. You might find if you sit down with them one on one and say, "I, I know it sounds crazy, but." In a perfect world, have you ever thought of scenarios? Have you ever thought about a situation where somebody might try to hack or attack um, the application or do something that you're like in the back of your mind going, wow, I wonder, I really think somebody could get away with doing this, right? We haven't really, I, I, so what I've what I've done at Bluescape is sat down with some, with some of the key engineers and even people like customer service reps and and salespeople and said, hey, you know, of all these things, um, let your mind go. Tell me, uh, are there some things that you've thought about over the years that maybe have not been addressed that you're like, really, it kind of keeps you up at night, wondering if there, and there will be people who will bring things to you at that point and say, yeah, you know what? Um, I don't know if this is a big deal, but I've always wondered about somebody trying, trying to do this, right? And so when you uh, discover through what they would call the brainstorming part of threat modeling, right? Getting people involved who are not not necessarily security people and maybe not even engineers, but you know, finding from people who have uh, knowledge of the the business, uh, you may find you may discover you know use cases there for threat modeling that that were you know not talked about before, and then you can kind of sit back and say, hmm, you know, is this this is interesting that maybe this is a threat that we hadn't thought of. And that, that's been my approach is to uh, keep an open mind, brainstorm, uh, bring in people who um, have different perspectives to see what kind of crazy scenarios they can come up with. Um, and and, and kind of, you know, filter it out from there is this as to what may constitute a valid threat. And then if you do hit on some things, then you can start looking at plugging that into something like the stride model. And uh, maybe start modeling it out. That that's been my way of looking at it. And it's also really the motivation to do threat modeling, isn't it, uh, Mark? For, because I think a true threat modeling that I've seen is something that really defines who's doing threat modeling and why are they doing it. For example, an architect, a security architect, or a product architect would probably want to do threat modeling to understand at a more component level what the inherent controls to an application mm -hmm. are. When a pen tester does a threat model, for example, it would be more from assessing the attack surface mm -hmm. of, of why that threat model needs to be. A threat model is just a means for better test case execution, for example. Yep. 
Yeah. Um, so I think I think like you rightly said, I think the one of the things that I feel is a critical success factor of threat modeling is really kind of understanding why you're doing it, not because somebody else is doing it or or my competition is doing it. I need to do it. Is really understanding in terms of what are my motivations to threat model, and more importantly, to yeah. your point of of methodology, is also not really getting caught up in the methodology as much as in if you use a methodology that works for you. I mean, if Stride works for somebody. That's great, but but it's really kind of understanding yeah. the combination of the methodology and the motivation. Yeah, and I, and I, I think that ultimately when you sit down and say, guys, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for all of us to work together on something, but perhaps discover, you know, one or more threats that we just hadn't really thought of, and that we had, you know, and now we're being, you know. It's something if you don't know something, but once you know something, right? Once somebody, somebody brings you a problem, right? Um, as the former mayor of the town here that I live in in Maine, right? Um, there's all kinds of things going on in the town, but if you don't know what's going on, you can't fix things. But if somebody right. comes to you and says, hey, the culvert over there is washed out and we've had a rainstorm, then you go fix it, right? Once you find out. Okay, the threat would be that you're going to lose your axle on your car if you don't if you go into this hole, right? So similarity similar with uh with with, with Bluescape or you know any any organization, if there's threats out there potentially that you don't know about, obviously you would like to know about them. Um, one way of going about that would be threat modeling, but to get to those threats, to get to the actual threat itself. You may need to involve people that are not security experts, like I said, from across the enterprise, and, and, and you know, just brainstorm and see what they come up with. Because uh, there may be, you may find that if somebody has got some idea in the back of their mind that's been bothering them for a while, that you could actually model out as a threat that you wouldn't have known otherwise. You know, Mark, we're at the top of the yard, but I want to kind of, I want to ask you a final question that's more. That's more philosophical, if you will. Um, you know, we're 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 in difficult times. We're just we're, we're probably hoping that the worst is behind us with the pandemic. Um, but if you were to just kind of step back and say, you know, the past, let's say the past decade from 2010 to 2020 has been largely in AppSec, has been about, I think much of the last decade has been almost overshadowed by DevSecOps and automation and AppSec in scale and things like that. Yep, some some companies have reached it. Some have understood the need to go chase that dream. Um, some have fulfilled that dream as well. Um, if you were to think of that or something else, in your opinion, to be what constitutes the major um, part of the last decade's AppSec, uh, in, in the AppSec world, what do you think is in for AppSec or what do you think is going to be in, going to be the new AppSec world in the next decade? Well, yeah, that's good. That's a great question. Um, and uh, as a former mayor uh, politician, <laughs> I will give you. That's a good question. Um, I will give you. I will give you the. Uh, you know the. Uh, well, I, I also have a law degree too, so I will give you the politician legal answer. It depends. <laughs> Right. I mean, that I, I've learned enough to try not to try to outguess where things are going. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning is going to play a lot into that. Right. No, no matter how it plays out, uh, you're going to see more and more um, involvement of AI and ML um, into the into the DevSecOps, into the app um, with different tools, vendors, solutions, uh, you know. And so I, I would say that's. I think that's kind of a, an obvious answer, but I think that's where things are going. Um, I think we still got a lot of work to do as far as people are truly adopting DevSecOps and just getting that right, right? Um, you know, it may have been the last decade where, where DevSecOps, you know, came along, and maybe this is the decade where we we, we do better, at, we get better at perfecting it and, and making it, um, you know, more, um, uh, you know, click of a button here and there and, and getting it involved and installed and, and, and up and running and, uh, and, and more efficient. Um, so, um, yeah, I to answer your question. I think that's, that's where things are going. It's, it's, it's hard to tell. I mean, you know, let, let's, let's watch this video 10 years from now and see where, you know, where we're right or wrong and what, what did we miss? What, what, what did, what did we miss in this pot? What, I don't know, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm missing the big picture. I don't know. 
it's uh it's there's too much going on out there right now especially with, with uh um with COVID and everything else um you know i i do believe though rahul that it, we, with appsec right it comes down to the basics too you always want to fix the basics if, if you're trying to do all this other stuff right and you're not and your appsec your your developers and your teams are still writing bad code they're still writing insecure code right and you know maybe it's a vulnerability that makes it to production but it's also going to be caught you know in the in the pipeline you know hopefully and they're having to fix it um so the goal would be to don't don't write this you know and, and don't write the bad code to begin with make sure your your code is more secure um and that and that's never going to go away right that's a fundamental um, so I think that that's also shouldn't be, shouldn't be lost in the big discussion, right? The ability to work with developers, educate them on, on, uh, writing secure code for whatever language they're writing in, um, will make it just that much, that much easier, uh, regardless of what tools and automation and all that. Um, but if we overlook that and we kind of move away from that, um, then, you know, we're going to keep getting, you know, bad code reviews and, um, it's just, it's wasting everybody's time. I think one of the one of the significant people of a, 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 a composition of people who watch this podcast or is interested who, who we want to want this podcast to reach are people who want to get into AppSec or people who want to really move up the AppSec value chain. I think so. Therefore, I think irrespective of what holds or what direction AppSec uh, takes in the future, I think one of the things that both of us can agree on is that there's definitely AppSec is here to stay. Oh yeah. Um, um, at least for the next. Uh, how many ever years so we don't know probably like you rightly said we can't really guess which direction it's going to take but it's only going to be upwards is i think something that we could really kind of agree yeah. on all right yeah. i would say if somebody is looking to get into appsec right um assess where you're at right now what, what are you doing right now what are you in security but doing something else are you a developer are you an architect you know why it asks yourself why why do i want to get into appsec is it because it's like super cool um, someone said I should join it. Um, the pay's better, or there's more jobs, or what? What is the motivation behind moving into app store? You know, um, are, are is your motivation that you just know that code is bad out there, and and applications are bad in many ways, and you want to make it better? That's a great motivation, right? You want to move into a world. I want to make the world a more secure place. That should be the answer. I think that you know, I want to move into an area where I can make a difference, where I can actually. Uh, I mean, potentially do some hands-on code reviews, work with engineers. Uh, maybe you get into pen testing, learn how to be a pen tester. If those are all the motivations behind going into AppSec, then I would say that's great, right? But if someone's just doing it to, you know, keep their job going and, you know, just pay the bills and, and because, you know, because my other job's going away, I would say, you know, think about it. But, but, but regardless of where you're coming from, make sure that you have some development experience Right. If you can, if you don't get get some, go to Udemy, go go online, learn something, build something, go through the process of going through that. Then you can develop the empathy for the developers of what they go through. Right. Understand that a lot of this is trial and error. You got to be, uh, you know, di diligent, persistent whenever you write code to figure something out. Um, and you know, and then again, assess the motivation of why you're you're doing this, and then. Um, maybe if you're lucky, find a mentor in this business. Find a mentor that that you know, or you can reach out. People can reach out to me. I, I'm, I'm I'm making a big mistake here. People can reach out to me on LinkedIn, right? <laughs> and uh, I mean, I get back to you right away. But if if you watch this podcast, like, hey Mark, you know I, I want to AppSec. You know, ping me on LinkedIn. Um, I will try to answer uh, questions as they come along, because um, it's all about making us more secure and, and raising the bar for the entire um, industry, right? The more people that we can get doing AppSec um, and doing it well and, and doing it for the right motivations, then then, then that's great. And I'm, you know, I'm more than willing to try to help if I can and provide guidance, um, you know, outside of this podcast. I think that was a perfect way to kind of end this conversation, Mark. Thank you so much for being part of this. Um, I'm so glad we were able to kind of catch up finally, and yeah. and 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 I, I'm I'm kind of really looking forward to more great things from Bluescape. Uh, now that you've spoken and with with all your experience, I'm sure we're going to see more of you 
uh, in the coming days uh, 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 for, for people to kind of learn uh, uh, from veterans like you. And thank you once again for joining us on the podcast today, Mark. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.